so I don't know, I don't know the song. It is recording. Cool. So recording. Okay, so yeah, this is about creating the X Factor, and as I said, there are technical components which are called the X Factor that we're going to go over, but also this kind of approach that you know, elite cricketers have this ability to clear the ropes um, and they kind of have this special trait. Um, it's a whistle-stop tour. Um, it's kind of a blanket approach on what I've read from lots of different sports, um, from research, from journal articles, theses, um, but also just my opinion on what we can do as a kind of a coaching uh, team, uh, especially take an idea of what you like and just kind of just delve deeper. Um, I'm also um, at the moment raising money for uh, the NHS um, and if you'd like to make a contribution to um, that would be fantastic at the end. Uh, so creating the X Factor. So the aims of this presentation um, are cricket and where the game might be headed, um, what is involved with hitting boundaries and how can we train to hit boundaries. So this is creating the X factor and coping with the forces that are associated with that. Um, I'm not sure how well this video will stream on your... This is one of my, one of my favorite innings and it's really good demonstrating how well he is at hitting the ball. So clearly um, a fair amount of X factor in that. Um, so what is the, the goal of batting? Um, it's to score runs and reduce dismissals. Um, where the game might be headed, um, obviously money dictates a lot of what we do. Um, and there's, I would say, three major cash flows. I'm sure there are more than this, but uh, test cricket, T20 cricket and 100. Um, obviously there's only 15 to 20 players in 12 test playing nations all with different amounts of money. Um, but there are eight major T20 leagues, men and women around the world, and really there are a few more than that. So we're looking at 180 contracts per year to well over a 1,000. Uh, and this presentation is gonna be aimed more at the 1,000 uh, contracts. But as you've just seen in test cricket, it also comes out as well. So really important that um, this X factor approach. Uh, so T20 cricketers, currently the top batsmen are all fantastic hitters of the ball, uh, clear the rope with incredible consistency. Uh, Finch, Maxwell, Roy and uh, Quinton and Scott come to mind like they, um, they absolutely smoke it anywhere they want. Uh, they do do the basics better than anyone else and it's really important to understand that this is just a part of the game, not the entire game. Um, but hitting boundaries is increasing. So this is the IPL stats. Um, I feel like in the first year, bowlers weren't quite prepared, uh, but then they came back in the year after with more resources and better tactics. Uh, but since then, boundaries have been increasing. So as a coach, we need to be able um, to know how to hit boundaries and how to uh, try and get our players to do so. Um, we're going to be looking at hitting sixes in particular. And um, there are two factors in hitting sixes. So we've got um, carry distance, um, which is the ball angle plus ball velocity. So this is um, the optimum angle of ball flight is 42 degrees. And with the best batters in, in the world at the moment are striking at 28 degrees. And uh, so this is just biomechanics of how far, how far the ball's going to go if you hit it at the right speed. Um, and uh, they find that 42 degrees was uh, the uh, angle of variation. If you miss that by 43 degrees, it went up too far in the air. Um, and batters are trying to avoid getting caught as well as hitting the ball a very long way. Um, so they found that 28 degrees was the, the best angle. So what we're going to mainly focus on in this presentation is ball velocity. 
and we're going to look at three different sports that have been doing this for a long time. So improving strength to improve ball carry. So in golf, um, they kind of created this model of how to hit the ball further. Um, and at the bottom, you've essentially got your linear velocity of club head, which moves to your angular velocity, which then goes to forces. So everything about this presentation is producing force onto an object, which is the bat and the ball in this instance. Um, and we're going to go over lots of summation of segmental forces. Um, if you look at the segments, you've got the leg, the torso, shoulders, arms, wrists. Uh, the ground reaction forces that are associated with hitting a long ball. And then we're also going to touch on the stretch shortening cycle. In golf, uh, the body will encounter up to four times body weight during a golf swing. So that... Um, that equates to essentially the club head being 60 kilos at impact. So you think how heavy a, um, a golf club is, that is however many percent when it gets to 60 kilos. So the body is undertaking large amounts of force. Um, in baseball, they found that an 80, 85 centimeter stride um, with around 300%, 80% of hip width was kind of optimal. Um, the left foot was slightly closed at ground contact, creating a closed kinetic chain. Um, again, they found e increased ground reaction force and the sequencing of the kinetic chain. So we're seeing a few similarities in um, uh, different sports. Then moving on to cricket, uh, slightly different um, from what they've said is uh, hitting the sweet spot. So the sweet spot is obviously the middle of the bat and they found this to be a really important factor to um, hitting the ball uh, hard. Uh, in cricket, how do we coach that? I'm you know, not so sure. The professionals seem to hit it um, more consistently. So is that due to repetition? Uh, is that due to them doing other factors better? There might be a psychological um, and mental way of hitting the ball uh, on the sweet spot. Should you be focusing on how far you want to hit the ball? Should you be focusing on where you want to hit the ball on the bat? I'm not sure. Um, and we're not going to focus on that in this presentation. Uh, and then you've got bat speed, again, becoming an additional 40%. So up to 80% has been equated between hitting the sweet spot and uh, having a fast bat speed. So the consistencies in the research from what I can see is Hitting the sweet spot's important, having a wide base, creating a fast bat speed, creating large amounts of ground reaction force, and utilizing the stretch shortening cycle. And we're going to try and go through all of those today. So in cricket, uh, they did the paper from Peplo, and the three key time points that they were measuring 28 parameters at were the start of the downswing, the start and the end of the forward stride, and then the point of impact. They found three things to be uh, contributing to two thirds of bat speed, which is the X factor, lead elbow extension, and wrist uncocking. And what's really important to notice here is that it goes from proximal areas of the body, which is your <clears throat> closest to your center, so that might be your hips, and then it goes further out to your body, so moving out to your elbow, elbow and then to your wrist so it's going further away proximal to distal and this is called your kinetic chain <clears throat> and it's how we're going to increase back speed so it starts at the legs moves to the trunk the shoulder the elbow and then the wrist again proximal to distal and this is all due to the conservation of momentum. So I'm gonna play this video, hopefully it works. Momentum is defined as the product of the mass times velocity. Conservation of momentum, that's also generally defined as... Linear momentum in a closed system remains constant when no external forces are involved. This is best demonstrated with a Newton's cradle. This little device of suspended steel spheres is generally known as a Newton's cradle. They're all the same size and mass. We're going to give it a little try here, a little push. It's great for showing the conservation of momentum 
but you can see the, the velocity and movement is transferred through the center spheres to the one on the other end. If we push two of them at a time, it does a similar effect. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a uh, modified Newton's cradle that has a tapered size of spheres. We'll give that a try. This is an example of the bead necklace. A little slip. So what I want you to think of is that now this is your hips moving through to your shoulder, through to your elbow, and to your wrist. So as the mass decreases, the law of conservation of momentum would suggest that the end one is going to go faster exponentially. And this is what you see in the slow motion video. Yes, uh, transfer momentum from one side to the other. Moment. So a good visual demonstration, um, I thought, of how uh, the body moves. And so the hips start the kinematic sequence, the shoulders, then the elbow, then the wrist. And as we can see, this is um, demonstrated in golf. So with the 33 and the pelvis speed, that is the fastest it gets. It then decelerates and allows the shoulder to come through at its fastest speed. This decelerates and lets the arm come through at its top speed. And then the um, hand and club speed come through at the fastest after that. But there's a really clear um, sequence of events that occur. This is also seen in throwing. So with the acceleration and deceleration of each segment in a baseball pitch. Um, so trying to notice that it gets to its fastest point on the purple arrow, that's the pelvis. Then it decelerates and the torso is at its fastest. And then that decelerates and the elbow is at its fastest. And then that decelerates and the arm um, accelerates to its fastest position. Um, and these are all happening one after the other. And as the pelvis accelerates and then decelerates, it provides stability so that the torso can then accelerate. <clears throat> so what is the X factor? Um, this is the body's ability to separate the pelvis and the shoulders at the top of the downswing. So what I want you to imagine is you're looking at someone um, from the top down and that you're looking to rotate them. So the 45 degree angle of the hips is makes an X with the 90 degree angle of the shoulders. And I'll just play this video that demonstrates it quite nicely. So at the top of the downswing, we have an X with our red line because the red line goes from the right hand side of the hip to the left hand side and the shoulders again left to right and it creates a nice big X. And this is where we create our ro rotational power. Thing. Um, so continuing that kinematic sequence, um, there's a difference between uh, men and women and the men um, extend the elbow during the downswing and the females um, actually begin flexing. So we're looking to extend this sequence as long as possible. Um, and so should we, we want to be coaching, you know, the pelvis moving and then the arms extending as far as they can. And this is going to create the maximum amount of velocity on, um, on the bat. Um, females have been coached in golf to be able to extend, uh, but we haven't seen that in the female game in cricket yet. So how do we improve the kinematic sequence? So there's, there's limited research from longitudinal studies that I've read. I'm sure there are lots out there. I just um, I haven't read them yet. Um, some opinions give very niche ideas. So there's bands everywhere trying to move um, different segments at different times. Other opinions are to just completely ignore that, don't worry about it, the player will be able to do it if they're strong enough. Um, and then we'll also look at different sports. Um, I'd like to think there's a blend of all these ideas. So my kind of framework that I've designed 
is on the right hand side here. Um, and it's basically built around these three principles. Remove that which is a hinder to technique, uh, improve the strength, and then improve the power on top of that. Um, so the fundamentals are always going through up, up the left, uh, and they stay throughout the um, uh, throughout practice. Um, and then you've got stability, mobility, and those are kind of your building blocks. You then build strength on top of that, and then you bring power on top of that. So what are the fundamentals? So being strong in fundamental lifts, the squat and the hinge, um, our hip dominant exercises are going to be key to performance. As that club head or the back speed is away from the body, the hips and the posterior chain need to be pulling really hard to stop that back coming out of position. And having a good level of strength also reduces the chance of injury and increases the amount of training you can do in a season. So that's going to be really important for us. Um, some basic balancing, if you can't balance on one leg with eyes closed for 10 seconds, you're going to be struggling to create any power off one leg. Um, we can then use unilateral strength exercises of eight reps or more. Uh, and these are just kind of your strong fundamentals, single leg IDL, squat, very split squat. And then we can move to basic plyometrics, single leg hop and lands, linear and lateral, which kind of look like cricket um, in their own right. Uh, we then want to train the core. So our core is our facilitator and is a conduit to, um, for producing force in the legs all the way up until the wrist. Uh, and the three movements that are really important there are anti-extension, anti-lateral flexion, and anti-rotation. So on the top here, you've got the anti-rotation, the middle anti-lateral flexion, and then anti-extension in the bottom. And it's basically based around the principle is that you can't shoot can cannons out of canoes. So really getting a strong base of what to, and then to build on top of that. So mobility, stability, continuum. So if you've never seen this before, it's well worth um, doing a little bit more research into. Uh, and it, essentially the joints stack on, on top of each other. So the ankle, we want lots of range of motion on the ankle. But then the knee, we want to keep quite stable and we don't want that moving all the time. So moving left and right is a big no-no. Uh, hips, we want them to be nice and mobile. Lumbar. lumbar and lower back, we want to be nice and stable. Thoracic spine, again, mobile, scapula, and then it continues throughout the body. So for example, in a squat, we want to get nice and low. We need good ranges of ankle mobility and good ranges of knee mo uh, hip mobility. Uh, but if the knee's moving left and right, we know that there's a problem at each end. So we want to make sure that knee is staying nice and straight. For example, if they collapse in, in a valgus, it's, the glutes aren't firing to keep that knee stable. Um, so in fast bowling, this happens again. So you have a brace front leg so that the body can flex over the top of it. So this slams in and that can flex over the top of it. Uh, and it's the same in rotational sports. So in the transverse plane, the body must brace. So that left hand side must brace so the right hand can rotate around it. So for mobility, uh, we want large ranges of internal and external rotation around the hips. Um, large rate ranges of thoracic extension and rotation. And this has been um, linked with lower back pain in golfers. So going back to the slide before, we want our lumbar spine to be nice and stable and our hips to be mobile with our thoracic spine. Um, and they found that a uh, lower back pain was linked with decreased trunk extension strength, left hip abduction weakness, and poor thoracic sp spine range of motion. So that's a good indicator that we need these parameters. We need this um, rotation around the hips and the thoracic um, to absorb forces in those end ranges. Um, and and is, as we improve those, we will continue to be able to train longer and train, uh, train more. So having a neutral pelvis is um, vital for our rotational sports and uh, having an anterior pelvic tilt is an inhibitor for rotational athletes. Um, so what we want to be first testing is can they hold the neutral pelvis um, in a lying position, standing position and then during athletic movements. So on the left, we've got during lying movements, like an, um, a glute bridge, and you can see the body goes into quite a bit of extension um, 
and we that lumbar spine goes into extension we want that to be as flat as possible again same with the rdl and what we want to be cueing there is can we can we keep the water in the bucket and if possible we might just even go into a posterior pelvic tilt so just a touch of water out the back um, and that's a really good way to cue athletes to keep the pelvis in Pretty of unfortunate still on that screen there, but these are a couple of exercises we could do to increase movement around the joint. So I'm in a quadruple position and I'm trying to bring the knee down to the floor and away from the floor. And then other ways you can do it. So this is standing now, and I'm trying to rotate the hips as much as I can, left and right. And that getting that again, just looking at getting the pelvis dissociated from the shoulders. Once we've done that, and we've kind of had a go at that, we can try and start to increase ranges of motion. So this is external rotation, And then this exercise is internal rotation. So just a couple of ways, and there are lots more ways to try and increase rotation around the hips. Um, when we're looking at the thoracic, we're trying to make sure that we go for extension first. If you can't extend, um, it stops movement around the joint and um, that can inhibit uh, different movements so we want to extend first and then rotate after it's really important that we lock the hips in so the hips and hips aren't producing any rotation so this is an example of extension so just going through a different couple of different um, joints Again, locking in the hips and rotating. And as you can see, that looks like a big um, X factor with our pelvis and shoulders separating. So putting the two together, um, and we want to now encourage the X factor. So here we've got a band that is keeping my shoulders straight and my hips coming through so this is like the top of the downswing and then this is an example of the hips assisted so putting the band around the hips to encourage that rotation internally Um, and at this point, it might be interesting to try and think about what cues we're going to use. Uh, so it might be something like a, a drop the right knee or push the hips through. But um, currently, I haven't, I haven't seen anything to suggest what are the best cues um, to use. But hopefully try to um, have that kinesthetic feel. So once we feel like we've got a good idea of increasing those ranges of motion around the joints, um, we've now increased the instability because the body's not used to dealing with forces at end range of motion because it's got a new range of motion now. Um, so we need to make sure that we increase the strength around those areas. Um, again, remembering that four times body weight during a golf swing, and this might not be exactly the same cricketers, but it might be similar. Um, and you can see how much force this um, this golfer at the bottom is going through here. Um, so to make sure we're increasing those, uh, sh those strength and those different ranges of motion, we can use overhead squats, which is going to challenge leg strength and scapular stability. Um, and it's all, you're going to need a large range of uh, rotation in the shoulder and thoracic extension. Um, a stiff leg deadlift to really target the posterior chain. Single arm rows to make sure that the shoulder and the scapula is nice and stable. Um, moving the shoulder through that full, full range of motion. 
And then we could also use lateral lunges to um, target that um, internal rotation, making sure the feet are facing straight. Once we've got to go at um, increasing the strength, we might increase the power. Um, as you can see, not a perfect demo by any stretch of imagination, but um, in golf, the downswing was 200 to 300 milliseconds. So we've got a good amount of time to create force. Um, and in this example here, um, at the top of my downswing, I'm on zero, and I've moved to 200 milliseconds by the end of my downswing. So there is an, um, there's an ability to load and extend the rear leg. Uh, so there's a force going through the floor on the right-hand side, uh, and then this extends through the body, creating triple extension here. So ways that we can um, provide triple extension in the gym is power cleans, and then we can move on to med ball throws um, to try and create that rotational power. At the end of power, I would say there is the stretch shortening cycle. Um, so I wouldn't be moving on to this first before getting the fundamentals nailed. Um, and it's not been, uh, the research isn't completely consistent, but what you want to imagine is there is an elastic band from the shoulder to the pelvis. Um, and if we can move this hip further back, it increases the stretch shortening cycle. Um, which works like an elastic band. So the faster you fire it, um, the faster the band's gonna go. Um, you know, and the question is, could we use isometrics? Can we use different weighted bats? Um, can we try and throw med balls before um, hitting um, cricket balls to try and create a post-activation potentiation response? Um, the research is unconfirmed at best. Um, however, there's, there's, uh, there's likely to be lots of papers um, that will demonstrate either way. Um, so how are we going to coach this? So I just added to the framework of practice. We need to make sure that we're practicing this um, and giving the opportunity of plenty of trial and error. Um, so this is me just skewing some. Um, and as, as I said, not a perfect example, but it's giving the players the opportunity to range it without consequences um, and, without a, and with a visual aid, just hitting the net on the right hand side and what you think is a good connection um, isn't going to give their, um, their body enough of a feedback loop um, to so that they've hit it well. So it's really important that we give them practice of swinging the bat max, at max velocity and that might even be just swinging the bat without a ball or cricket ball, um, because even then you're actually practicing with lots of different variables like a moving ball. Um, and again, what cues are we using? Hips forward, shoulder behind? Um, do we need to add a visual aid of how far the ball goes? Do we need to add a kinesthetic aid of allowing them to feel where that hip is? Um, you know, lots of different ways. Um, we could look at different sports. So what, what there must be different. There are lots of different rotational sports. Um, for example, Tom Banton um, wrote in an article how important his reverse sweeps were and his hockey. Um, and so, you know, is there the X factor in hockey that we could be pulling upon? Um, especially at Kingston Grammar School, we've got lots of hockey. Um, and another legend of A.B. de Villiers, did he have the X factor? He was an excellent golfer, excellent tennis player. Um, and he was just an all round good athlete. So is that what we need to have the X factor? Um, just stumbling, I stumbled across Ashley Barty. So she was um, a professional tennis player until 17, um, but she switched to cricket because she liked the idea of team sports. And in her first ever game of cricket, she scored 63, then 60. Um, and she got signed with the Brisbane Heat after two games of playing um, club cricket. She then went on to score 39 of 27 balls in her first big bash game and is now the best tennis player in the world. So did she have the X factor? What did she have that um, meant that she could hit the ball so far and so strong? Um, we could also look in different parts of cricket and where do we see it more regularly? Held it back. More than weighted, weight. um, see it display. What a shot because he had no pace to... Down the ground, launching one high, 
has it gone long? So what I'd like to look for is if you can see his hips um, square at ball contact. Drag down again. Six again. Morgan is on the charge. Rashid Khan is under pressure. That's some way to bring up your 50. Well, Owen Morgan has had one thing on his mind since he's come out of the middle. Owen Morgan on the other hand. So for me, the question I'd ask is, is it difficult to achieve the X-factor position when playing square? Lots of people seem to sweep the ball miles. Um, so, and actually when you think about the position or the pull, uh, the pull shot, what you want to be doing is extending that rear leg, swiveling so that we're front on, and then by naturally raising the back behind you, you're going to create a big X-factor and big, big pelvis type thorax separation. So when and where do we need to improve it? It might be just hitting down the ground that is actually challenging to create this position. Um, and so this is kind of where we bring it into the last bit of like, and this is where I'd like to bring a discussion in uh, after the meeting is, you know, coaching, who should we be coaching this to? Um, oh, sorry, who should be coaching this? Is this a strength and conditioning job? Or is this um, the technical coach's job? And the lines become quite blurred when you look at the biomechanical analysis of it um, and how to strength train it. But, you know, it's probably a blend of the two. And if, if we have good communication between us, um, then we should be able to influence it quite well. Um, who should we be teaching? Who would we teach this to? Is this a skill that um, the upper years need or should we be teaching this lower on down lower down the school so they have plenty of time to practice it um, but then if we teach this to young kids is that going to um, subtract their ability to play other shots which we need them to play more conventional shots like the block or the drive and will they be able to differentiate um, so where does that fit into our coaching um, but to conclude um, remembering this is a small part of the game uh, but if we can have stability and mobility in the right areas um, create strength and power uh, and create an e environment to learn the X factor based around the basics, um, then I think we'd be in quite a good position. Uh, there are some rest uh, references, but yeah, thank you for listening. And that's, um, that's what I've got for today.